Thank you, thank you. Good morning. How are you all doing? Are all your parts here? Great. Wasn't that wonderful? Well, this morning we get a chance to spend half an hour together looking into the idea of who we are. And to do this in half an hour is quite a, a challenge. But if we do it together, I think we can go somewhere that might be kind of interesting. So to do this, I'm going to ask you to think about a fundamental question. We're going to talk about what Emily said about relationships. But we're going to start with this first question. Are you an O or are you an H? That's the question. And by the end of this talk, we should be able to give you a sense of how you would like to respond. Are you an O or are you an H? So it'll be like a fun quiz where throughout the talk you'll see, oh, God, I'm probably an O or I'm an H or something else like that might come up. Okay, so put on your experiencing hats as we go through this. And part of this is really a, a journey that for me began a long, long time ago when I was a kid. I used to ride my bike up in the hills of Los Angeles where there wasn't much water, but I found a creek. And the creek would be filled with animals, birds. I found some salamanders. There were fish in the creek. And hours and hours and hours would go by, and this flowing stream would just be there, and I would be there. And then I'd get back on my bike and go back home. And I never really understood what was happening there. Like, was I the kid who was there, like 11, 12 years of age, or was I the bicycle that took me there? Or was I the creek with the water? What, what was I? And how did I get in this body, you know? I mean, we talk about embodiment. What does it mean to be born into a body? So as time would go by, this question and these following questions drove me wild. And you know, we always talk about a journey of life. How many of you would say that you are on a journey through life? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. So we're all on this journey, right? And the word journey is a really interesting word because it comes from the old French journée, and it, that's from the, the Latin for diurnal or daily. And we have this incredible opportunity as uh, Caroline Welch, who's the CEO of our institute, the Mindset Institute, and I were very close friends with a fellow, I don't know if you recall him or knew him, John O'Donohue. Anyone know, know, know of John? He was a wonderful poet and philosopher and mystic and a former Catholic priest who unfortunately died about almost 10 years ago now. And, um, but in, in knowing him and teaching with him and, and just reading his beautiful writings, John used to always say that every day was like a lifetime and we should celebrate the sunrise and celebrate the sunset, uh, but know it deeply, right? And so this is an opportunity to take the word journey and realize it is a daily experience. You can ask these questions, right? Who are you? What are you? How does your self work, whatever the self is or the selves that you have? What, what is this all about? So that's what this journey we're on is really asking. Now, you might say to me, well, Dan, it's so obvious. The journey is the journey of the mind, right? This is my mind. I'm born into a body, but it's my mind. And that's the source of myself or my many parts of a self, you know? And I think many people would agree with you. How many people would say that your mind somehow gives rise to your sense of self? Raise your hand, let's just see. Okay, so that's most people. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. So you say, well, okay, if my mind is giving rise to my sense of self, what in the world is my mind? Now, I come from the field of mental health and I'm just gonna give you a summary of 25 years of exploration in that field we don't have any definition of what the mental is. I'm serious about this. It actually, it turns out other fields also don't have a definition. In fact, they say you shouldn't define the mind. But this is interesting because if you don't define the mind, how can you say what the self is? So we assume since the days of Hippocrates 2,500 years ago that the following statement is an absolute truth. That statement is mind is what brain does. Right? So I'll put on my science aspect of myself to talk a little science here. Now, that's what Hippocrates said. William James, the grandfather of modern psychology. Hippocrates, the grandfather of modern medicine. James affirmed what Hippocrates said, and it's pretty standard. So if the mind comes only from your head, then it's natural for you to say, well, the mind comes from my 
self, my body, which is the origin of myself. And what I want to do is together question whether, in fact, that is true. Were these sages of our modern fields that shape not only science, but also society, were they right? So in looking at this deeply, you come up with four facets of the mind, at least to try to describe it. The first three you're probably very familiar with, right? It's subjective experience, you know, the feeling texture that happens within consciousness. You've got the idea of being aware, of being conscious. And so people talk about mindful awareness, or in our research center, you know, we study mindful awareness versus other kinds of awareness. And then you have the idea that you have information processing that happens even outside of awareness that shapes yourself. So all these are a part of the mind, and yes, the mind gives rise to the self. But then there's a, a question that comes up in this fourth facet of mind, which isn't usually talked about. In the field I work in called interpersonal neurobiology, we bring all the different sciences together into one framework. And in that field, we actually offer a definition of the mind, not just these descriptions, and it takes this following triangle and it says, how are these three things related to each other? So here's we're going to get into the O and H thing pretty closely. So if you want to answer the quiz, get ready for this. The mind is somehow related to our brain, of course. So if you get knocked on the head or if you get drunk tonight at your dinner or last night maybe at the party, you know, you will affect your brain, which will affect your mind. It'll affect your subjective experience, your consciousness, your information processing, for sure. But what about relationships? How many of you would say that your connections, let's say, with people you're close to, shape your mental experience? Anybody would say that? Yeah, so we have a relational side to the mind. But if the mind is just brain activity, like we've been told for 2,500 years, then what is, is it? And some people say, well, Dan, it's obvious. The brain is responsive to light. The brain is just responsive to social signals, which is what a lot of scientists say. And I want to have you consider that that's only part of perhaps a larger story. So the question here is, what connects these three things? So what is shared in common between the brain that sits in your body, so we can call that the embodied brain, your mental life, and relationships. Now, this is not an easy thing to go through. In our online program, we're on the in-person courses, which you know, take a lot more than 30 minutes. You know, we spend a long time on this one question. And for the most part, scientists and practitioners and teachers and parents, no one raised their hand and said, I got it. But here's a proposal that what it is actually in the brain is electrochemical energy flow. That's a good way of summarizing the brain. Some patterns of energy flow have symbolic value, so we call that information. So information would be, in this view, a subset of energy flow. Flow just means change. Energy we'll talk about in a few moments, but it comes in different forms, electrical, chemical, Right, if I stop the flow of sound moving toward you, which is kinetic movement of air molecules, that's stopping energy flow. So it's not some mysterious thing. It may be wonderful, but it's not really mysterious. It's part of physics. If physics is a part of science, talking about energy is scientific, even though people get nervous about it. So energy flow is what is shared in relationships, right? Right now, between me and you, with light, photons, and sound, air molecules moving, we are sharing energy and information flow. I'm watching your handsome and beautiful faces and soaking it in. It's very different if I were just looking at a little pinhole of a camera, which you do when you do these online things. It's just a lot different. We're connecting with each other. So literally, there's the physicality of energy. So we come with this view that relationships can be defined as the sharing of energy and information flow. The brain in its body, the embodied brain, is the embodied mechanism of that flow. But here's the amazing thing. When you look at it this way, you come up with this wild proposal that the mind, beyond subjective experience, consciousness, and even information flow, perhaps, and maybe it's related to this fourth one, is that this is a part of a system. Now, what is the system that would include your relationships and your embodied brain? Well, this is, again, 
another two months of discussions. <laughs> now in one minute, I'm going to give it to you. But the way to talk about it is it's part of what's called a complex system, which is a mathematical term. And once you look at these criteria that say this is a complex system, mathematics demonstrates not as a hypothesis but as a fact of the universe that there are what are called emergent properties. One of those emergent properties that math states is called self-organization. So the proposal is, what if the mind, beyond subjective experience, consciousness, and information processing, maybe they're related or not, let's now look at the fourth facet of mind, is the self-organizing process of this complex system. Then, when you look at this definition, what's interesting about it, number one, it says that it's emerging from and also regulating the thing itself, so it's why the mind has a mind of its own. Anyone ever feel like your mind has a mind of its own? Raise your hand. The second thing it does for this talk that's really important is it says, you are not just your body. If your self comes from your mind, this is saying, you know something? You are not just your brain. That the mind is emerging as much from relationality as it is from your brain. So um, Caroline and I went to Namibia recently to do some research work and, and clinical work with different tribes that were there, and there's a horrible famine going on in Namibia, and there's also a drought, and there's also terrible diseases going around. And um, one of the things that's amazing about Namibia is we know from linguistic studies and genetic studies that the tribes that are there are individuals who are as closely related to who we think were the original human beings that we can find on the planet. So it's a really interesting, from a scientific point of view, group to, to hang with and talk with. And so we were doing that. We were talking with them, getting to know them. And around the campfire one night, I said to the translator, I said, can I ask you to ask this tribesman a question? He goes, sure, what's the question? I said, they've got drought, they've got famine, they've got disease, and they're so happy. <laughs> and he looks at me, I said, can you ask him why his fellow villagers look so happy? Are they really so happy? He goes, you want me to ask them why they're happy? I said, yeah, ask them why they're happy. So he translates it, and he gets a response, and I will never forget that moment when the villager says in his language, and the translator translates it into these words. He says, he says his people are happy because they belong. They belong to each other, and they belong to earth. And then there's this pause, and I'm going, oh my God. And then the villager asked the translator, asked me a question, and he says, in America, do you belong? And I thought about back home, here. And I thought about our modern culture, wherever it is. And I thought, oh my God. We have pulled ourselves out of belonging in the most unhealthy way you can imagine maybe even starting with Hippocrates to say that the mind is just the activity of the brain which was a physician's attempt to try to make sense of things we can honor that and William James was just honoring that great but it's not only um, maybe not the full story but there's a problem we have you know it's incredible to be here in San Francisco because the last time I was up here I was asked to go and teach at some high schools down the peninsula. And you know, there's a train that goes here from San Francisco down to San Jose. And at the high school, when these really, really devoted adolescents wouldn't get the grades they were supposed to get, they would jump in front of the train. And there were a lot of suicides. And so they asked me to come talk to the kids and the parents and the teachers and the administrators about what they could do. So the adolescents, actually, some of the students interviewed me beforehand. They got their cameras set up, and they, they interviewed the talk I gave. You can watch it from our website. But the thing that really struck me as I was looking at their faces was, what is going on in our modern society that we create such lack of belonging that some young person with all the hope and possibility that exists would jump in front of a train? Many of them would do that. We have to think about that and take responsibility for what we're doing, which is what I said to them. 
We've created this culture that has a lethal lie that the self is the same as your brain, that the self is separate, and that relationships don't really have anything to do with it, or maybe they're icing on the cake. They're not icing on the cake. They are the cake, gluten-free cake. <laughs> so then you can ask the question, if this is true, if the mind is both coming from your brain and its body and relationships, if that could possibly be true, you say, well, that's goofy, Dan. That doesn't make any sense. How could one thing be in two places? Because skull nor skin is a boundary for energy and information to flow. Right? That's the answer. It's one system. We are part of one system no matter what society tells us, no matter what the schools reinforce. Danny, do better than Billy and Sarah on your spelling bee so you can hurry up and get into a better junior high school so you can do better high school so you can get into the most elite college so you can get into the most renowned graveyard that exists. <laughs> it's insane. We've lost our minds in modern society, literally in every way you can determine what that phrase means. So with this definition of the mind as a self-organizing process, here's the absolutely amazing thing that comes up. It says that you can ask the mathematical question, what optimizes self-organization? And there's an answer. It's called integration. They don't call it integration. We'll call it integration. But it's the linkage of differentiated parts. That's what the math says. They don't have a name for that. This has been an amazing thing to say it. So what does that mean, integration? What does that mean for you who are part of not just this moment here, right, whether you're here or in virtual land watching this, it's also a movement we all can belong to in the deepest sense of belonging. Because you know something, you all know this, I hope I'm not shocking anyone. These bodies we live in, they're not gonna go on for more than about a century, right? But you will exist beyond the life of your body because your mind is not the same as your body. And part of being invested and in belonging to this movement is that you can go beyond the materialistic view of mind as just brain activity and let me accumulate more stuff and I'm not really happy or have meaning in my life so I gotta get maybe more stuff and then I get more stuff and more stuff. Soon we are stuffing ourselves full of meaningless garbage and destroying the planet. That's what we're doing. Basically, it's, it's our planitude, our attitude toward the planet that we need to correct. So this idea of integration brings up these issues. It brings up the notion that you can catalyze these qualities of integration, which is basically harmony, flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. I'm an acronym addict. That is the acronym of FACES. Um, and the key thing is that you maintain differentiation. So when you think about the incredible panels we had yesterday, with Rhonda and John and, and the, the group from the East Bay Meditation Center and think about the whole idea of inclusion and recognizing differences in race and differences in our histories, differences in our religions, our gender, our lack of gender, all the different ways we can be differentiated. Integration isn't tolerating differences, it's thriving because of them. That's the beautiful thing about this mathematical notion. And here's the wild thing. When you have integration, you go to this central flow of harmony, and when you don't, you get chaos or rigidity. Just look at the planet. Just look at the planet. Whether you're talking about our social lives or our planetary lives, just look at the planet. Integration impaired can be a way of understanding your own life. Integration impaired can be a way of understanding the whole planet because we belong. Are you H or are you O refers to the idea if we were a hydrogen atom, and if we were an oxygen atom, and we were in this weird configuration called H2O, and we sat there and said, I'm an O, and I'm better than you, and the H you know, comes over here and says, well, we're two H's, and we're better than you, you dumb old O. <laughs> How would you ever see the creek, or the waterfall, or the rain, or the oceans that give life to all beings on this planet. If we believe that Dan is just in this body, we're cooked. We belong to each other. And you can say, well, that is really weird. How do you help people realize that? And so here's what I'm gonna show you. I did a study of 10,000 people who did this strange practice called the Wheel of Awareness. 
We don't have time to do it here. But if you go to our website, you can stream it for free and just do it and see what it's like for you. But I did it with 10,000 people, recorded the results when they reported what they went through. And all I'm going to say is this. People start having this experience where they've never meditated before in their life or have been doing it for decades and run monasteries. They have this experience as one Microsoft engineer who is 70 or retired who came to think Jack Kornfield and I were doing in Seattle. He gets up, he takes the microphone, and he says, I just retired from Microsoft. I'm 70 years old, and you know something? My wife is a therapist. She dragged me here. I've never done therapy, never done this dumb meditation stuff. Forget mindfulness, schmindfulness. He goes, and you have me do this wheel. So we're going, oh my God, what's he going to say? And he goes, and then we took a break. And he goes, and I left the conference center, and then tears start coming down his eyes. And he goes, I went out into the park, and he says this over a long period of time, but I'll speed it up. And he says, there's a gardener watering the roses, and the butterflies are flapping, and the birds are flying around the gardener, and he's crying, and he's going, we're all interconnected. <laughs> and everybody starts to tear up or they can't move. 70-year-old Microsoft engineer, okay? And I only say that because, you know, whether you're someone with no experience, this wheel does some amazing things. So I take the correlated data, and I go, I'm hanging out with these quantum physicists who I hang out with, 150 of them um, in a monastery in Tuscany, so it wasn't so bad. Uh, <laughs> and I say, what is energy? What is energy? And this is what they say. They say, energy is the movement. You ready? This is a week-long discussion with 150 physicists, so it's condensed into one slide. <laughs> Energy is the movement from possibility to actuality through a series of probabilities. Now, that is a three-month discussion in our course, so I'm going to give it to you just from a take-home point here. This is a graph trying to do it. Forget the bottom half of the graph. That's if you're going to be a brain scientist and study this. This is the idea, and to put it simply, and Brendan, are you ready for this? Thank you. Brendan and I are coordinating ourselves. See, you think it's magic. If you look at the plane of possibility, this is what a quantum physicist at the extreme would call the quantum vacuum, or they like the phrase sea of potential. So when I presented this recently to Arthur Zions, who's the former president of the Mind and Life Organization and a quantum physicist, he was five thumbs up for this. And he said, why don't you just call it the sea of potential? But on this graph, it's more like a plane. The plane of possibilities where all possibilities arise. Then, Brendan, if we go up to a plateau, you then increase these plateaus right there. Thank you, beautiful. Um, you go to a plateau of increased probability, like I am Dan and I live in a body. All my science has ever told me the mind comes from the brain, and my school teachers told me Dan, 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 this. And that's my belief that I'm a separate self, is a plateau. And then, Brendan, if you go up to the uh, peaks, there you go. Those peaks would be, below the peak would be thinking, the peak would be a thought. Below the peak would be emoting, the peak would be an emotion. Below the peak would be remembering, the peak would be a memory. And then you can show there's a continuity because I have only certain thoughts that come when I have a plateau that restricts my belief to thinking the self is separate because someone told me the mind comes from the brain. And I only got one body and brain. You see? Does that make sense so far? There's a lot of nodding heads, so thank you, thank you. Um, so here's the amazing thing. With the, with the 10,000 person study, the humbling thing was that people basically said the same thing no matter what continent it was on. And I did this lots of different uh, cultural backgrounds and educational backgrounds and religious backgrounds. Here's what they say, and here's the bottom line. I'm going to go back for a moment. Basically what this wheel is is this is the hub is the idea of knowing of consciousness. The rim are the knowns, like the first five senses, right? The sixth sense of the interior of the body, the seventh sense of our mental life, and even an eighth sense of our sense of connectedness, the most underdeveloped sense we have, how connected we are to each other. So integration of consciousness is where you differentiate the knowing from the known, and amazingly, what people say when they go into the hub, because we bend that spoke around or retract the spoke into the hub, and that's when they get the experience the engineer talked about. People talk about unbelievable joy, love, interconnection, spaciousness, openness, as wide as the sky, as deep as the ocean, infinity. 
over and over and over again. Some of my students actually were here in San Francisco, came to a number of places where I did the wheel. They said, no one's going to believe you. I said, I'm recording it, so I have the data. Um, here's, the, here's the proposal that the knowing of consciousness comes from the plane of possibility. And that's another two months we can talk about that. But the issue is that when you drop into presence, you're dropping into the plane. And so when we think about what was said yesterday about diversity, right, and in-group, out-group distinctions, teaching people to drop into the plane of possibility, which is, I think, what mindfulness practices do, and it's what presencing does, allows you to basically liberate yourself from the brain's vulnerability to say there's an in-group and out-group. You're not like me, and I don't want to like you. And I, in fact, the more threatened we are, the more hostile we are to the out-group. So dealing with all these reactivity states is something you can do from the plane. So the last thing I'll just go to is this idea. Is the self a singular noun, or is it a plural verb? Where is your mind, right? And what would an integrated self be? Are you an O or are you an H? You're both. And in fact, we are all of us, but how do you do the me and the we? How do you keep me differentiated and we? Because you and your body is good. Sleep your body, exercise your body. Embodiment is great. That's part of the story. That's your H. But what's your O? Your O is your relationality. So to put them together, here's what I want to introduce you to. <laughs> Seriously. Me plus we, honoring both. Exercise your body. Do great things with your body. Enjoy your body. But we is an equally important source of your identity. And together, when we integrate like that, the kind of waterfall we can create, the kind of oceans we create, the kind of life as H2O together brings up this. It brings up the notion that when we can be a mui, when you see the way another person is doing well, you have empathic joy, you love their success. Imagine a world like that. And when you are able to create this kind of integration inside and between, within and between where your mind is, we can belong. We can belong to each other now and for generations to come and make this world a kinder and more compassionate place for all people and living beings in this planet. Thank you very much for your attention.